this evening, uh, we are happy to welcome John Mansur, uh, who is the founder and president of Product Management University, offering basic and advanced training and certification for B2B product management, product marketing, sales engineering, and customer success. Um, that was formed in 2001 with the goal uh, to build, market, sell, and deliver products with quantifiable strategic value that keeps new customers coming and existing customers paying. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to hand the microphone over to John and uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Tom, and uh, good evening, everybody. It's it's great to be back in Silicon Valley again, even if it is virtual. I think my last trip uh, out there physically was for a product camp uh, back in the pre-pandemic days, so it's nice to reconnect with this group again. Um, and great to be uh, great to be having a nice discussion with you tonight. And uh, so let's see. Let me share my screen here. Hmm. All right. And hopefully everybody can see that. All right. Now let me get my gallery so I can see all of you here. Um, okay. So we're going to talk about customer discovery and, of course, the subtitle here, right, creating products that practically sell themselves. So back when I was a product manager, you know, that was more of a uh, metaphor, right? My, my bosses and executives were always like, you know, we need to create stuff that sells itself. Well, in today's world with product-led growth models, uh, that's no longer a, a, a metaphor or a cliche. We actually have to do create products that sell themselves. So some of you uh, are probably working in that arena now. And, you know, obviously the the point of tonight's discussion is creating great products that give customers tremendous value and things that they love and benefit them and give them, uh, you know, quantifiable value. It all starts with discovery, and that's really where we're going to focus tonight. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Product Management University, I'm going to give you just a couple of quick slides here just to set the stage for what I'm going to talk about. Um, so as Tom mentioned, we target four disciplines in our training. And so the common denominator amongst all of these is how we understand our customers. Um, and then we can, you know, build what we need, market, sell, and deliver what we have, okay? So we train those four disciplines, but the common denominator in all of them is how we do discovery. So you see at the top of my slide here, right, we have to understand our customers and in the B2B world, uh, it's the organization. We have to understand them from the top down, right? And then once we understand what our customers are trying to do and why it's important to them, we look at our own strategic goals and figure out where things that are valuable to the customer match up with uh, things that are important to us. And then we build, market, sell, and deliver accordingly, right? So it's a great way to get all of the customer-facing disciplines on the same page, going in the same direction, uh, and all trying to help customers accomplish the same thing, which in return helps us meet our own company goals uh, much easier um, in theory anyway, right? So that's the basis for what we're going to talk about tonight here. Um, so three things to remember about Product Management University, and we're going to talk a lot about the, uh, the first one tonight, which is outcomes, right? So when you start with the customer outcome as opposed to a customer problem, um, it makes everything easier, okay? And that's because it just cuts to the chase. If you know what your customers are trying to accomplish, all you got to figure out is why they can't get there, and that will forge the direction for your product. So it's a much easier approach than starting with a problem and sort of working your way back. Um, the other thing that we do is we personalize the training, right? So when you go to a training course, it's like, okay, all these things are great in the classroom. I want to know what good looks like for me. And so that's what we do. So the, the case studies are your customers, your products, your markets, your, your business model. And so when you walk out of the training, you know what good product management looks like for you. And the last thing is we specialize in B2B, okay, which is in these days B2B to C, right? So your customers who are businesses uh, buy your products and they may extend those products to their customers who could be consumers. Um, so we fine-tuned product management practices around that. And what's really different between B2B and B2C is the definition of the customer. Okay, so more on that tonight. So that's all you need to know for now about Product Management University. So 
What we're going to do here before we get into the presentation is we're going to do a little discovery warm up, right? So you know how athletes, uh, they warm up and do calisthenics and stretch and do a lot of things before they play a game. So before we dive into discovery here, we're going to do a little discovery warm up. And what I've got here are a handful of purposely ambiguous questions. Um, and Tom's going to put these up in a poll. I'll show them to you on the slide first, give you a little backdrop, and then Tom will put the poll up and we'll get your thoughts just to see kind of where everyone's mindset is with uh, with discovery uh, right now. All right. So let's look at the first one here. Oh, and by the way, as we go through this presentation, I'll, I'll pull the chat up here and try to keep an eye on it. Um, uh, and, you know, I don't want to wait till the end if people have questions. If you have a question, throw it up into the chat. And then, um, uh, you know, I'll try to address them as they come along. Okay, so here's poll question number one. So let's say you are meeting with a customer. Okay, so there's no, th this is a pure discovery meeting. There's no product issue, no hair on fire situation. It's not a sales situation. You're just meeting with a customer to just understand more about them in an effort to make your product better. So if you could only ask one question, which one of these questions would you ask? What are your biggest problems? What are you trying to accomplish? What are your most critical needs? Okay, so if you can only ask one question, you gotta pick one. This is the fun part, right? This is how we get the, this is how we get the discussion going, all right? So go to the poll and then let's see how everybody votes and we'll see where your minds are. So we've got 64% of the people that have voted so far, we'll give them about another 20 seconds or so here, we're up to 70%. We'll follow the 80-20 rule, see if we can get up to 80% here. And I will not vote since I already know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, almost there. Anyone else? All right, we'll close the poll and share the results. All right. So looks like 24%. What are your biggest problems? 60%. What are you trying to accomplish? And the 16%. What are your most critical needs? And I just saw someone put in the chat. It looks like my uh, my bullet point for some reason on the first question is much bigger and there's nothing subliminal there about that. That is just an oversight on my part. It, di it didn't look like that a few minutes ago. Um, okay. So when I typically throw this question out there when I'm teaching a class, uh, and I like the way this group is thinking here, right? The most popular answer is uh, number one, what are your biggest problems? That's usually the one people people uh, most often choose. Oh, wrong way here. Um, that's usually the most popular one, but obviously in our model, and we're here to talk about, uh, this group here got it right, is what are you trying to accomplish, right? And I sort of gave away the answer in one of my previous slides there. Um, and so here's the here's the thing about this one, right? It, when I was coming up through the product management ranks, it's the way I was taught. It's the way everybody talks is let's go find and solve customer problems. Um, and that's not wrong, right? Because when it's all said and done, we're going to solve problems. But it's easier to find the biggest problems and the real problems if you start with the outcome, right? Because as you well know, customers will tell you about a lot of problems, not all of them related to the outcomes that have the most value. So if you start with the end in mind, which is tell me what the end game is and tell me why you can't get there, then right, all you have to do is focus on those. You know you're delivering uh, real value. Okay, question number two. All right, most important to uncover. So again, you're in a customer discovery meeting and if you could only pick one of these, okay, it is most important to uncover the strategic goals of the customer executives, right? So in the C-suite of the customers, the operational goals of the customer department heads, right? Head of HR, IT, sales, whatever, uh, or tactical user problems. Again, if you could only pick one.
This is a tough one. We're at 71% so far, 75. All right. we'll give it another five seconds here. Vote now or hold your peace. All right, so I'm gonna go share results. Okay, strategic goals of customer executives. So uh, I'm curious, uh, and anyone who voted, uh, anyone who voted for strategic goals of customer executives, I just have a couple of folks chime in here. Tell me what your reasoning behind that was. Anybody? It's going to determine what these those operational goals are, and some may some of the operational goals that intermediate managers may have may not be aligned with the, at the time with the strategic goals. For long term, you need to be aligned with where the strategic goals are with those executives. The other ones flow down from there. Thank you, Jim. Anybody else? Lane. Uh, I was just going to say the executives have the ultimate buying power decision making. So if we're going B2B, it probably makes sense to be able to pitch them on why this is critical to the overall strategy. Okay. All right. So so that is the thinking now. Um, so let me, I'm, I'm going to back up to my previous slide here for a minute. Um, and so again, just like this slide here, where you're obviously going to ask all three of these questions in a discovery meeting, what are you trying to accomplish, right? Why is that important to you? What are the biggest problems accomplishing that? What do you think are your most critical needs, right? So you're gonna go through some version of all those. Here, it's the same thing. And Jim, for the reason you stop, you always have to start at the top, right? So what is the organization trying to accomplish strategically? And then how does that shape the operational goals at the department level? And then, you know, it's a trickle down, right? So then the department goals are what shape how users have to change their jobs. And so, so you know, if I need to do this to improve the performance of the department, that means we need to change a number of things in terms of all the jobs we do in that department, which get us to the user, technical user problems, right? So again, all three of these are relevant, but it's the starting point that's different, okay? And so for those of you who've been in product management any length of time, you know, if you start with a user problem, trying to work your way back up the chain to find out if that's a real problem or not a real problem or how important it is, is much harder than if you start at the top and just work your way down. And in my mind, that's, you know, that's the way to pretty much guarantee that you are focused on the right users and the right jobs for your product is just understand what's happening at the top of the organization and how it filters down into areas where your products have some relevance. Um, and that'll take you directly to the users and the roles and the jobs that need to be improved the most. Uh, and that'll tell you where to focus your product and, and you'll know you're delivering good value, strong value. Okay, so we're gonna have a little fun here with this one. Oop. My Apple mouse is very sensitive. Okay, so however you define a solution, which of these four would be the best example of a solution? How you ever do you define a solution? Okay, so number one is this beautiful apple crumb cake. Number two is the recipe for how to make it. Number three is the actual ingredients. And number four is the dinner party. So in your however you define a solution, which of these is the best example of a solution based on your definition of a solution? One, two, three, or four. Just at sixty percent now, it's still trickling in here. Yeah, I always love the perspectives on this one. It seems to be an easier question because people are jumping in a little bit faster here. We'll give it another ten seconds here. So if you haven't voted yet, please get your click your clicker, and we're almost there. Two, one. 
All right, we're going to close at 74% here. All right, so here's a fun thing. There's no right or wrong with any of these questions. Okay, most of you chose number four, and in our model, number four would be correct. So for those of you who chose number four, tell us why you chose number four. Let's hear from a couple of you. So clearly this is a solution that is that is concerned with creating some sort of food item or a set of food items. And when you look at the outcome, how does it solve the customer's problem? The outcome is clearly to have a meal with that that uh, that item of food or whatever it is that is the product. So if you look at it that way, uh, that's the ultimate goal of the product is to is to affect the outcome of the customer. Okay, thank you. Who else? John, I would say it's the jobs to be done example of the milkshake in the morning for breakfast. Uh, they needed something fast and easy and they won't spill. Um, and that example, it's got nothing to do with the actual food, but the actual um, job to be done. So here, picture number four, obviously, the job to be done is is more about family time or, um, you know, uh, interacting at a, at a dinner table with your friends and family. And that's what you really are, are solutioning for with this pie. Okay. Uh, Manuar, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add with everyone, uh, it paints a story. So a good uh, product manager is actually a great story storyteller also at the same time. So it is uh, uh, other tree, it's not showing, giving you the story, but this number four, it paints the story. All right, thank you, Jim. Yeah, same kind of thing that uh, Debbie Sheesh was saying. It's outcome focused because a product is just a product is just a product. It's what the product does for somebody. The pie sitting there looks delicious and everything in number one, but number four is the reason you need the pie. You're making the pie. That's why you put the effort in. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, in the software world, we call it butts and seats. So adoption is the metric. Number, number of licenses and, and this correlation to revenue. So in one word, adoption. All right, thank you. Matt Bettina, it's been what, 12 hours since I've seen you, man? <laughs> yeah, I, I actually didn't make it this morning to product coffee, but um, yeah, I would say that number four is going to leave people hopefully with a memorable experience. That's what you aim for, I, I think, it, with your solution. Mm -hmm. And that's really what this is all about, is bringing it all together into that delightful experience for your customers, in this case, your guests. All right. Um, number four is aspirational. Yeah, good, good call. All right. So then for some of you who voted for number one, I'd like to hear from a couple of you. Why number one? Well, I chose number one because it was a simple solution. It's very pointed in terms of what it is. It's, it's a pie. Is Without knowing the problem or the ultimate goal, um, I went with simple, simple solution. Okay. Uh, who doesn't love simple, right? <laughs> Anybody else could, voted for number one? Uh, and it could be, you know, that that's a good point about the assumption it could have been that the the problem to be solved was i need something cool to post to my instagram <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh let's see here Latha. yeah um the reason i chose number one was okay your for me it looked like you for something for the best so, so. That is simple. I think about the first. So, 
that's what I'm saying. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, all right. So again, in our in our model, number four uh, would be the best example of a solution based on he, how we define it. So just for fun here, I'll I'll give you each one of these in uh, in in software parlance. Okay. So number one is the product. Okay. It's the it's the apple crumb pie cake. Okay. Number two would be analogous to uh, the functional spec, right? The recipe. Number three, which are the ingredients, that would be the code. And number four would be the outcome. Okay, so for those of you who voted number four, uh, you know, the way we define a solution, our model, a solution and a customer outcome are synonymous. Okay, and just like everybody said, right, the reason you make this beautiful dessert is because you want everyone to have an enjoyable experience at the dinner party. Okay. Now, all of you, since you're all product people, I'm sure if people came to your dinner party, they would have a great time because you're all so witty and charming. However, having this great decadent dessert to stuff your face with makes it even better, right? All right, last one. True or false? Business requirements have nothing to do with my products. True or false? This one's the fastest, uh, fastest question to answer so far this evening. All right, getting there. Almost eighty percent. A one more person to answer. There we go. We're at eighty-one percent. Anybody else want to vote? You've got about six seconds or so here. No. All right, we're gonna wrap up and sharing the results. <laughs> okay. So I told you they were purposely ambiguous questions and this one, this is my best trick question. And 90% of you fell right into the trap. All right. Mm. So let me clarify the question, okay? When customers are defining requirements to do things to make their business better, they are doing it through the lens of my product or not doing it through the lens of my product, okay? So the answer that I'm looking for is true, right? When customers are talking about what they need to do to get better to their better at their business, they're not doing it through the lens of my product, all right? And the point I want to make here with this question is, and this is one of the hardest things we have to do as product people, uh, and we'll talk more about it when it comes to discovery, is when we're talking to customers about what they need to do to just simply get better at whatever part of their business they're trying to improve, we need to look at it through the lens of what they do, not through the lens of what we do. And that is one of the hardest things to do because we are immersed in our product you know, 24-7, 365. And it's hard sometimes to see the customers in the market um, without that filter over top that is our product. And in a lot of cases, when it comes to discovery, right, it can get us into a leading the witness situation when we start having discovery conversations because we're trying to get customers to some place that, you know, we've already we've already arrived. Um, any thoughts there? So the person or persons who answered true, let's hear from you. What were you thinking? Because clearly this question didn't trick you. So if you answered true, it, the question didn't trick you. Why did you answer true? Okay. It's all right. You can be shy. I don't want to force anyone to talk. Um, okay. So in the purest sense of the word, when customers are defining requirements for their business, it is a true statement. Those requirements have nothing to do with our products. Eventually, our products can become relevant to those, but as customers are defining them, 
uh, they don't they don't do it in in relative terms to to our products because they might even know, not know who we are. Okay, Debashish, you have a question. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, John, in not in terms of business requirements defined by the customer, but the translation of customer needs into business requirements defined by us, the people who are creating the product or uh, you know, updating the product. So if we, we create the business requirements, then uh, then uh, they are relevant, right? Because we are looking at the customer problem or the customer's desired outcome and translating those into uh, business requirements that do pertain to our product. So there's a difference between business requirements created by us or business requirements created by the customer. Uh, yes, that is true and correct. And once you make that translation, then this becomes a, you know, uh, this becomes a false statement. But before that translation, it's true. And so I think where we're going here with this discussion as it relates to tonight's topic of discovery is when we are doing discovery and gathering the requirements that customers have mapped out for their business, we want to bring those into our organization unfiltered, unbiased, uh, until we start designing the product and figuring out how to address those requirements with whatever we're going to do uh, to our product. And I think it's just the, you know, the point of the, the question here is making sure we understand business requirements without uh, the bias of our product uh, and just seeing it through the lens of the customer. So I just found the wording pretty uh, misleading here. Uh, if it were worded something like "customer business requirements are influenced by my by my products or not, in, you know, or are not dependent on my products," that sort of thing, then I would have understood what you were trying to get at. All for the idea of staying in the problem space and not getting into the sniffing your own fumes problems that happens so easily when you fall in love with your own product, which is some, a solution, but not necessarily the ultimate solution. And the other thing is the product, the customer's problems can change over time. And if you don't track that and evolve with it, you're going to be in trouble. Somebody else will get it. So get where you're going. I just thought it was a sneaky uh, or uh, beyond misleading <laughs> <laughs> wording. Well, see, that's, uh, and yes, you, you are 100% correct. Guilty as charged. That's why I said up front, these are purposely ambiguous questions to get the discussion going. So okay. mission accomplished. Thank you all for participating in the discussion. Okay. So <clears throat> there are, you know, three fundamental principles um, when it comes to B2B customer discovery that I think are really important to just sort of keep in mind at all times. So I'll cover these first, right? So number one, customer discovery ends with users. It doesn't start with them, okay? So again, we're product people. We spend a lot of time talking with the people who use our products. And it's easy to lose sight about things that are happening above those users that influence what they do and how they do it, okay? And so I have seen a lot of product managers in my time go and find what look to be like legitimate user problems, right? They walk like a problem, quack like a problem, uh, and we solve them, but then they're not tied to an outcome or something that has valuable impact to the customer, right? So we think we're solving a big problem only to get a, mm, you know, okay, that's nice, all right? So none of us want to do that. None of us want to be building nice to have features. We want things that have measurable impact for the customer. Okay. So number one, customer discovery ends with users. It doesn't start with them. Principle number one. Okay. So this is what's different about B2B and it's the top down customer discovery, right? So if you look at my sample org chart here of a customer organization, think about, you know, the senior executives in your customer organizations, when they put the strategic priorities in place, okay, for, you know, the next year, two years, three years, that are, those represent the things they need to do to make the business better at whatever it does, right? Make them better, more competitive in their own industry. And as we discussed before with one of my other ambiguous questions, right? Those strategic priorities shape the operational priorities and sales, marketing operations, IT, HR, so on and so forth, okay? 
And so those operational priorities are intended to make the departments better at their business in support of the strategic priorities, right? So if we make one or more departments better at their function, then we are, you know, supporting by default the strategic priorities. And then down at the, you know, bottom layer here, it's the tactical priorities, right? So those operational priorities drive the tactical priorities down for the people in the trenches who are doing the work, okay? And those tactical priorities are in place to make those people better at their job, okay? So if you take it, you know, whether you go top down or bottom up, I want to make people better at their job to improve the performance of one or more departments so that the company meets its strategic goals to deal with the dynamics in its own market, okay? So whether you go top down, bottom up, all the dots connect. And I think that's, you know, when it comes to discovery in a lot of cases, we we tend to miss the layers above the user. In fact, I would say that, you know, a lot of product companies out there, the typical view of the customer is really that bottom layer. And then, you know, we, we solve things down here for people doing the work in the trenches. And then we try to make a big leap back up to something that's strategic. Um, and sometimes it feels like a stretch, right? Versus if we talk about, you know, how we help users do a job to improve the performance of the department and then how that supports the strategic priorities of the customer, then you, you kind of have a complete story there. Okay. So when I talk about discovery ending with users as opposed to starting with them, visually, I thought I'd give you a nice visual here. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Principle number two, directly related to that, is stop starting with customer problems, right? And so this is, again, it's not a matter of right or wrong, because when it's all said and done, we're going to solve problems. But it is much easier to start with the outcome. So when we're doing customer discovery, okay, and I, I'm, I, I still do plenty of sales calls in my role here because I'm the salesperson and the trainer at Product Management University, right? So when people call me and are interested in training or back, you know, I started my software career in pre-sales, you know, I would always ask customers in a discovery meeting, you know, back when I was in pre-sales, it's like, whether you buy from us or our competitors, you're going to spend a half a million dollars. What is it you're trying to accomplish and why is it important? Okay. And then we would get to, okay, well, why can't you get there? And then we would start to get into, you know, how our product, you know, was going to fit or whether it was a good fit or not. Okay. So if you start with a problem, it's much harder to figure out if that's a real problem, a valid problem, or the impact of that problem versus if you start with an outcome, a layer or two above the users and figure out why your customers can't get that outcome, you'll get right to the problems that if you solve them, you know you're delivering guaranteed value, okay? And that's what we all want. We wanna deliver guaranteed value, okay? So, so don't start with the problem. Start with the outcome and, and the biggest problems will hit you right between the eyes. It, it, I promise you it's a it's a much easier way to figure out um, how to shape the direction of your product uh, if you start with a customer outcome as opposed to a problem. So to that point, <clears throat> I'm going to give an example here, right? And, and this this will look familiar to a lot of you. So let's start with what I would call a problem-based discovery, right? So every one of you has had a customer, and this is actually a real life example from one of my clients. They targeted, uh, one of their target customers were skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes as we know them, okay? So the customer says to them, the admission process is manual, it's paper-based, it's error-prone, okay? So for all of you product managers out there, substitute admission process for something your customers do, and you've all heard this, something's manual, it's paper-based, it's error-prone, okay? So when we hear something is manual or product people, what's the first thing we think of? What's the first word that comes to mind? Automation. There we go. It's the A word, automate. When something's manual, let's automate. Okay. So it would be very easy for us to say, okay, well, let's, let's figure out how to automate the admission process. Okay. We'll get rid of the paper. We'll get rid of the error, so on and so forth. And then we start looking at as is and to be, and we go through all this you know, further what I'll call product discovery to automate the admission process, okay? Taking this at face value, all right? So yeah, we're gonna understand where all the problems are, so on and so forth, and we're gonna automate around that. Now, when we go to outcome-based discovery, watch how the conversation completely changes, okay? 
So outcome-based discovery, the first question we want to ask is, and again, so the other part of this being product people is when we hear a problem, we automatically go to solution. So this is a little bit of something we have to change in terms of how we think, right? So when a customer says, I have a problem, let's go back up the food chain instead of going down into the solution, right? So the first question is, why is it even important for your organization to improve the admission process? Why do you care? And so in this case, um, uh, skilled nursing facilities, they are uh, they get star ratings uh, from the government Medicare system, right? That's how they get paid. So if you're not at least like four stars or five stars, you're not going to get referrals. And in nursing homes, literally their lifeline is referrals coming from hospitals, right? So if their star ratings are poor, they're going to not get referrals or they're not going to get good referrals, so on and so forth. So improving the admission process um, is one of the things that uh, apparently there are gaps or issues there that if they fix them, it would drastically improve their star ratings, right? So that's why it's important to the organization strategically, right? So we went up the food chain instead of, you know, down, okay? So we understand why it's important strategically. Now, tell me if you are going to do something to your admission process, what are the key outcomes you are looking for? Okay. Number one, we want to improve the patient experience. Right now, it's very stressful. We have to ask them the same 100 questions they just answered, you know, a week ago when they were in the hospital, so on and so forth. Okay. So the first outcome we want is to improve the patient experience, right? And then the next question is, okay, tell us what's detracting from that patient experience. Second thing, we want our caregivers to have more time with patients. Okay. That's a good outcome. Tell us why, right? So it is the workload, the administrative workload on caregivers is taking hours a day away from spending time with patients. And for those of you who have any experience with nursing homes, right, these people do not get paid a lot of money. Uh, they do it because they have a passion for it, okay? So they have a passion for, and they wanna come in here and take care of people, but then we burden them with all these administrative things and then they get burnt out and they quit, right? And so we get a lot of turnover, right? So we want people who wanna care for patients. We wanna put them in a position to make sure they care for patients. Okay, great. What's stopping you from spending more time caring for patients, right? And then we have a good picture there. And the last outcome here is we want to make sure when we admit patients to a skilled nursing facility, we have legally binding agreements, okay, to make sure we're inside the compliance, uh, you know, inside the lines with compliance, and we don't open ourselves up to liability. Okay, great. What are the biggest things preventing your admission process or standing in the way of you having fully compliant, you know, sort of closed loop, not open to liability agreements, okay? So if we were to just take the admission process and automate it, we probably miss the first two. We probably hit on the third one because we can, you know, require certain fields and make sure things are signed and so on and so forth and do all that. But we may not automate it in a manner that gets these first two outcomes. Okay. It would be really easy to miss this if we don't understand what the end game is. Okay. And so if you just start with a problem that something's manual, we may not automate it in a fashion that gives them the reduced workload on caregivers or reduces the stress factor in, in the admission process to get those outcomes, right? And if we don't do that, then we don't help them improve their star ratings and we don't help them get more uh, referrals, okay? Two completely different conversations. Okay, and so that's, you know, to me, this is the importance of outcomes and why you always want to start with the outcome, because if you just solve a problem at face value, not tied to outcomes, it, it's easy to miss, pure and simple. Okay, and the last principle here is our products aren't relevant when it, it, okay, so I'm talking about discovery. When we are in discovery mode, our products have no relevance to discovery uh, until we start designing and defining the solution or defining and designing a solution. Okay, so when we do discovery, we have to completely forget about our products. And even if you're talking to existing customers, you want them to forget about your products. Say, listen, pretend we don't exist. 
tell me what your priorities are in the department, why those priorities are important, how they play into something that's big and important to the company, so on and so forth, okay? And, and leave our products out of the discussion when we're in pure discovery mode. So I'll stop there, take a breath and see what kind of questions, thoughts people have on those three discovery principles, right? So it's products aren't that relevant, Stop starting with problems and discovery ends with users. It doesn't begin with them. Okay. All right. So give me your thoughts or questions to have on those three principles. The nursing home example is a, a very good illustration of being able to solve a problem without getting to the right outcome. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, listen, I was a product manager and, and I have less of an excuse. I actually came from a customer environment um, and, and eventually ended up in product management, managing products in the, you know, in the business function where I used to work. I used to work in a purchasing department, right? And the more, the longer I was a product manager, the easier it was for me to see the world through my product instead of seeing it through the lens of the customer. Okay. Other I'll, thoughts? Give you, I'll give you an example. Um, I sold laboratory equipment to pharmaceutical companies and it didn't matter if you brought out software that made their lives a whole lot easier. The biggest obstacle for them was how, how hard is this thing going to be to validate and Prove to the FDA that it's going to produce the right numbers. I can I can see it's going to save me a lot of time, your new features, et cetera. But uh, we already spent a year and a half validating the system. We're not touching it. Yeah. So until you understand that as a primary gating item and how to crack that nut. Absolutely. Yeah, I had a client who sold uh, medical equipment to, um, I think, to a dentist's office. And he said, you know, it, it was much less about, um, you know, the actual dental practice. And, and you more had to understand, you know, for each dentist you called on th their lifestyles. And, and like, it was, okay, am I going to buy this new equipment for my office? Or am I going to buy a new boat or a Mercedes Benz, right? And you had to understand that mentality, kind of the same thing, right? The outcomes, you, you got to understand the outcome before you can go and, and solve a problem. Other thoughts or questions? Do you run across issues? Uh, I'm curious for anybody, uh, especially this week is uh, Dreamforce with Salesforce going on in San Francisco. Um, curious when you deal with uh discovery exercises and you are kind of a embedded platform at the level of Salesforce or Microsoft mm -hmm. or Google. Um, do you, do you find that you have to do something to jar them out of this product centric? Um, you know, how do you enter, you know, they're, they're talking to a salesperson about how they enter in uh, customer records into a CRM. Um, yeah. They have, trouble kind of getting out of that framework because that's so embedded in the environment. Um, curious if you have any tricks or advice around folks that might be working in kind of a, a large environment uh, as their product. Yeah, I mean, what's always worked for me uh, when I'm in discovery mode is, uh, you know, I tell people just point bank, like, let's forget about what the product doesn't does or doesn't do. And let's talk about what the job task at hand that you're doing, what you want to accomplish and why and why it's so difficult getting there, right? And and try to filter the product part out of that conversation. Uh, to me, that's where I've had the best luck. And right. And so you, you you have to ask some of the same questions about three or four different ways sometime to really um, vet the answer or, or get the right response uh, that you're looking for, right? It's like, Yes, I'm I'm trying to put some customer information in the system. What I'm really trying to do is this, but the reason I can't get there is because, you know, something or other and try to get them to say, you know, without talking about the product, right? I have to go to five different places to get that information to create the account review to sit down with my boss, right? It's 
So yeah, it's um, it, it's definitely a challenge when someone is so entrenched in your product environment. Um, you know, getting them to just think about what it is they're trying to accomplish and and what the outcome is and why that's important. Um, you know, uh, comes down to your facilitation skills, which we will uh, talk about here in a little bit. Interesting. Do you do you frequently wind up with a like diverse set of answers, or do you find that it it more often than not converges once you talk to half a dozen customers? Uh, once you talk to a half a dozen customers, what you see is you you see it start to come together. It paints a full picture, right? Because you can talk to one customer and you think, oh wow, they're right on the money. But then you talk to five other customers and you get other perspectives or other um, circumstances where where they're trying to do the same thing or different reasons that they're trying to do the same thing. So you can sort of synthesize that around, okay, so if I'm going to help customers get this outcome, I have to think about three or four different circumstances or triggers that cause them to get into a situation that they want my help with. Lane's got a hand up. Yeah, sorry, just a quick question. How, if at all, are these principles different for B2C? So in B2C, you know, the buyer is the user and you're not dealing with the organization, right? So, you know, short of, you know, uh, parents buying something for their children or, you know, I'm buying something for, you know, uh, an elderly parent or something like that, the buyer is the user, right? And so you don't have the layers of the organization to deal with. Um and as we all know, in the B2B space, while the users may have some influence on what we buy, the buyers may have a different agenda. And so when we talk about top-down discovery, you have to tie the buyer's agenda all the way down to something people are doing in the trenches and make sure the dots connect. Otherwise, we miss something, right? And if, if we build it only to meet an executive need, then the product, the usability is probably horrible and people won't use it. So you won't meet the executive need anyway. And if you build it for the user, they might love our product, but it doesn't provide value up to the people who, you know, are running the organization and signing the checks because it doesn't, it doesn't impact their agenda. Thanks. That makes sense. Yeah. So pretty much the same outcome base, but you don't have to worry about the levels. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing, um, as consumers, we, you know, we kind of buy what we want, uh, and then we somehow rationalize or justify, right? In the business world, businesses can't, they can't make those emotional impulse buys like we do as consumers. It's, you know, they pretty much have to spend money on things that are going to benefit the business. Um, and there's a lot of oversight to that where it's like, hey, I have an iPhone 14. If I want a 15, I'm going to go spend 1200 bucks and get one. And, and, I don't really have to answer to anyone if I've got 1200 bucks to spend. Cool. You know, and I'll, I'll make up some reason like, oh, I just, you know, I want all my, I want all my devices to have a USB-C port instead of some having a lightning and some having USB-C, right? I'll make up some hoagy reason like that. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. You know, but hey, if it's worth 1200 bucks to me, who's to question it? Okay, anybody else? All right. So when, when we do customer and prospect discovery, just think about it as facilitating a business conversation <clears throat> with no other intent except, let me understand what you're doing to get better, why it's important to your success and why you can't get there, okay? Those are your three main objectives. And again, this is the really hard part for all of us product people because we are dying to do something cool with our product and we want to get to it. So I would just say be patient, okay? So common obstacles when we do discovery, and again, having been a product manager, uh, I tripped on some of these myself, right? So we subconsciously ask leading the witness questions like, um, is it a problem because all of your data is not in one place? Yes. Okay. Uh, or, or, you know, tell me, you know, tell me, um, 
you know, what problems you have because your data is not in one place, right? So we, we can lead the witness with those questions, even though we don't mean to, right? And then we get to like a lot of yes, no, close end questions. Is it a problem to do X or do you have a problem with X? Okay, so regardless of whether the answer is yes or no, it's kind of a dead end. So yes, I have a problem with that. Okay, you know, tell me about it. Okay, or, no, you know, worse yet, no, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question, right? Um, the other one is not asking why enough. Okay, so that's our go-to question, right? Is I have a problem with this. Tell me why that's a problem. Tell me why you even care about that problem. Tell me why everybody else cares about that problem if they do, okay? Um, and the last one here is having premature product discussions, okay? So again, if you're talking to existing customers, they're gonna wanna talk about the product and this is where you have to be a really good facilitator and say, okay, we're gonna get to the product, but first I want clarity on what you're trying to do, why it's important, what's stopping you and talk about some other things. Okay, so here's your takeaway for the night is I'm gonna give you these five questions here and there are a whole bunch of different ways to ask them. Um, and depending on who you're talking to, the context of these questions will change. So if you're talking to a senior executive versus a department head versus a user, the context around these questions are going to change, but it still comes down to these five basic questions. What are you trying to accomplish? Why are those goals important? What's stopping you and why? Question number four, what are you doing about it, right? And that's a different way of saying, what's your, what's your ideal solution look like, right? If I could wave a magic wand and solve this, what would it look like, okay? Or not even that. Sometimes it's tell me what initiatives or actions, things you are putting into place to deal with that. Okay, and then the last one, what metrics define success? Right. So if I'm talking to an executive, what are you trying to accomplish is more along the lines of talk to me about what's going on in your industry and how it's shaping the strategy of your company and what's most important to this company. Okay. Versus if I'm talking to uh, a department head, it's tell me what your priorities are in the department, why those things are important um, and why you're being asked to do those things from, you know, the C-suite up above. Okay, so the context around these is different, but again, these are your five basic questions. And again, be patient, ask a lot of whys, you know, and, and again, it's not like, you know, when you're talking to customers, you're always going to get a direct, straight, articulate answer to these questions. There's going to be a lot of discussion around this, right? The point is, get full context on all of these questions before we even think about the product. Questions about the questions. Okay. These have been serving me well um, since I came out of a customer environment. My first job in software was doing pre-sales, so I was a demo guy. And these questions have served me well since I was back doing pre-sales and demos. Um, and in fact, when, uh, you know, when COVID first landed, uh, nobody was doing training, just so happens one of my, uh, one of my old cronies that I used to work with back in my sales days uh, was a chief revenue officer for a company he said, hey, John, we've, uh, we've lost one of our uh, solution consultants can come pinch hit for me for a while. So for a few months there, I was actually a fractional, fractional demo person again. And, um, you know, right back into the groove even in a sales situation, these, you know, these questions, you will get, you will understand what the target is very clearly if you have a discussion around these questions. Any thoughts there? Okay. Do you, do you frequently wind up with a follow-up on question four uh, around, uh, you know, what are you doing about it? And then it's it's always kind of fun to follow it up with, is that working for you or is that not working for you and why? So, you know, the the tell me what you're doing about it is more of a procedural question like, okay, so if you're not able to do this, right? So if I go back to my nursing home example and, and we talk about, you know, we we're trying to give our caregivers more time with patients. And so my question will be, well, tell me what you're doing to get them out of the administrative workload so they can spend more time with patients. 
So it's more gotcha. of a procedural. Tell me what you're doing procedurally to deal with the problem, because that's what I ultimately I want to understand that because I may have right. We're product people. We may come up with a better way to do that than what they're doing. Mm. Or our product just may need to support some kind of a new process or practice or something like that. Um, so that's the importance of number four. Okay. And and you know, so Tom, it's a perfectly legitimate question. So it's like, okay, well, if you have been doing that, how's it working? Are you saving the amount of time? It's like, well, it's helping a little, but maybe not as much as we need to. That you know, you'd hear something like that. Makes sense. I have a, a quick question. Um, is there is it okay to ask a follow up question? Like, what happens if you don't find a solution? Like, what if? Well, yes. So that I love that question, and it, it's sort of implied in terms of you know it, it's sort of implied number four, which is if you don't do anything, what's the what's the effect of not doing anything? That's a great question. You know, and there are a handful of others that probably aren't on this list that that work well for you. Um, um, and for things like that, I'd say, you know, yeah. if they're, they're working well for you, then keep them in your uh, keep them in your bag. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, one more follow up on the why. Um, somewhere I heard that three whys are good, right? Because ultimately it becomes, you know, some existential thing about your life, like why this matters. Um, is there any rule of thumb there? Like should always have at least three to really get, because maybe the first why they'll be shy. Any rule of thumb there? Uh, to me, it's, you know, you keep asking why until you have full clarity. You know, like, so if you say to someone, tell me why that's important. Well, we just need to be more efficient. Tell me why that efficiency is important to your department and or this organization, right? Um, and you might have to you might have to keep probing till you get a definitive answer. Um, you know, so to me, when you when you walk away from a conversation and you have good solid answers to these five questions, you come away with things that if you help customers address these needs, they're very quantifiable. Like I can measure that. I can measure how much time you used to spend with patients versus how much you do now. I can measure how stressful the admission process was versus um, how stressful it is now or how much time it takes or whatever the case might be. And I think that's really the point here is come away with outcomes, obstacles, metrics, things that if I'm going to solve this problem, it is measurable value to the customer. Thanks. Other questions? Just to comment, uh, another question you could ask is, what's the cost of not solving this problem? Yeah. Uh, you may be living with it. What's that costing with you? In other words, what would it be worth to you to get this solved? Can you quantify that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because then, then they can see what their budget should be for a solution if you can come up with one. Well, yeah. And, you know, I mean, and... and you know, what's it worth to you? And sometime you'll get, you know, some of your customers who've really put the math to this. Well, it's like, okay, well, if I can give each one of my, you know, non-skilled caregivers two more hours a day with patients, that's X number of FTEs. I don't have to hire or blah, 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 right? They can, like, you can pin it down to something very specific. I'm sure the pricing oh. that data. <laughs> I had an interesting one. Uh, a guy who worked at like KLA 10 core or something. He to design, or he was a reliability engineer for their equipment. I said, so uh, what are you worth? I don't know. I said, well, so what does it cost if one of these instruments that you send out fails in the field? What's that going to cost? And we worked out the numbers for it, and we started to realize, okay, so if you prevent one out of 10 of these instruments from going bad in a year, you've made four times your salary <laughs> or something like that. It was just, yeah. it was it was really easy math by the end of it. And you have to make some assumptions along the way, but there were reasonable assumptions, of course. So just yeah. showing the risk reduction the guy brought, because he wasn't in a, something where you can just calculate a profit margin or something like that. It was all about risk reduction. 
But yeah. if you made reasonable assumptions and showed what the cost was going to be, now let's what's it going to cost in terms of if we lose a major customer because their process went down for a week because your piece of equipment failed, et cetera. Then what's that cost? And all of a sudden, we're starting to look at what happened to Boeing when the uh, 737 Maxes started going down. Mm -hmm. you know, billions and billions lost, and they still haven't recovered. I don't know how Southwest is doing as far as recovering from their debacle of last winter. But yeah. anyway. Yeah, I, you know, and you, you can look at these things, you, you know, quantifiable value. If you've gone into any fast food restaurant or fast casual it is rare that a person is taking your order. You're walking up to a kiosk now because it is so hard to find, train, and keep good people. And, you know, the the technology has come far enough that it's it's sometimes it's easier to order on the kiosk. You, you know and get to see that it's going to be correct. And, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're more likely to get the food that you ordered. Um, and so, again, right, you, you start looking at the dynamics in the market and the outcomes customers want, and and you see some very good solutions uh, out there in the market. I, you know, I, I love when I see a solution. It's like, wow, I didn't know I needed that till I saw it. It's like, that's a really brilliant idea. And again, you know, it all starts with good discovery. Um, okay, so ripple effect. <clears throat> The discovery, the quality of discovery, and this is, you know, I'll, I'll put the onus of this on product management more than any other discipline because, right, we're product people. Everything starts with us, right? If we if we are doing good, solid discovery and we have good, solid practices, those will carry over into product marketing, into sales, into our customer success teams. Um, and our product will actually reflect the good discovery we've done up front. Okay, and so for product management, <clears throat> right, good discovery when we're going to do a market update to our stakeholders or we're doing product vision strategies, if we got to create an MRD for a new product or our backlogs, competitive analysis, release notes, right, the quality and, and context of these artifacts all gets back to the quality of our discovery. Huge. Right, so think just think about your release notes for a second, okay. Instead of putting out technical release notes, you can say in this release, <clears throat> people who do this job task will be able to get this outcome because we've eliminated these obstacles with these features, right? So features become the last part of the discussion, not the first part of the discussion. You know, what's on your roadmap? Over the next six months, we're going to help nursing homes improve their admission process so to raise their star rating so they get more referrals. Here are the outcomes they're looking for in the admission process. One, two, three, here's why they can't get these outcomes. Here's what we're gonna deliver in the product to get those outcomes, right? It, it makes a very simple, concrete, high value story that everybody understands. And it all starts with good discovery. Product marketing, okay? So again, a lot of this is based on the discovery we do before we build the product, right? So the positioning or industry positioning or some of the sales tools, demand generation, website content, product literature, all those sorts of things. Think about customer success stories, right? If we do good quality discovery, we have essentially created the customer success stories before we build the product. And all we need to do is fill in customer names once they start to use the product, right? Because again, if we're talking about here's what we're going to help customers accomplish, here's why it's important operationally, here's why it's important strategically, here's why they can't get there, okay? And we've delivered products to address all that, then the customer success stories should be coming fast and furious and, and, and customers should be able to measure that value. They should be able to quantify that value pretty easily because we started with the outcome. Okay, similar for sales, right? The right. So, so when when I teach these courses, whether I'm teaching a demo course or I'm teaching a product management course, the customer discovery guide it's the same exact guide, right? We're having the same conversation. We're facilitating it the same way. We're we're extracting the same kind of information. Whether it's I'm talking to an existing customer, I'm talking to a prospect. Same approach, same way to facilitate a conversation. Okay. Um, 
The difference here is now I have to take that discovery and I have to demonstrate stuff I already have, products I already have to satisfy the need. Uh, we're not in build mode here, we're in sales mode. And your customer success teams, right? Onboarding, customer onboarding. We should be onboarding job tasks to get outcomes. We shouldn't be showing them how to configure a product and use features. We should be onboarding job tasks to get outcomes. Okay. And so the, the reason this is really important to product management is if we do this discovery up front and we're building job tasks, then customer success by default will be onboarding job tasks. Okay. We're going to onboard customers here and we're going to show you how to do things differently when you admit a patient. Okay, pretty simple. Here's how you'll evaluate the patient's current condition. Here's how you'll put together a care plan. Here's how you'll do this. Here's how you do that. Here's the outcome you want. Here's why you can't do that now. Here's how to configure the product to get that outcome. Knock yourself out. Okay, so the discovery becomes the common value platform for product management, product marketing, sales, and customer success teams. And again, I put the biggest part of this onus on product management because it all starts with us. So in some way, shape, or form, we have to figure out how to get ourselves out of the building, whether it's physically or metaphorically speaking, virtually, um, and get ahead of the curve and find out what's important to our customers, why it's important, and why they can't get there. Uh, because that's going to set the dominoes in motion for everything else down the line in marketing, sales, and customer onboarding teams. Other questions or thoughts about discovery? How does this, if anybody, again, volunteers here, you know, how, how does this philosophy, I know I didn't go into too much detail here tonight, but how does this philosophically speaking compare with discovery you're doing today? Anybody want to share kind of how this compares with what you're doing today? Hmm. <laughs> like what happens in this much. room stays in this room. Don't, no one's going to tell. Yeah. Although yeah, it is recorded. Matt's comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll take some questions there, man. Okay. So here are some change management considerations for you when it comes to discovery. Okay. Make outcomes, not problems, the centerpiece of the conversation. I promise you, you will you will come away with so much more um better insights if you make outcomes the centerpiece and not the problem, okay? Because we, it's human nature. When someone says problem, we immediately want to, like, we want to solve it, okay? So when we start with outcomes and we get into the problems, everything, you got full context there. Second thing here is more patience and curiosity. Be curious, okay? Just keep asking why. Well, why do you care about that? Why does that matter so much? Why is that important to so-and-so? What does everyone else think about that, Okay. A lot of different questions you can ask there. And then the last point is develop your facilitation skills. And again, it doesn't matter what role you're in when you're talking to people either internally, when you're talking to executives, your stakeholders, customers, prospects, become an expert facilitator because it, it it's a real art um, when you're having a conversation to, to just make sure you're getting really good, strong, valuable information coming out of that conversation that helps you know exactly, you know, what direction you should be going with your product. Any any interesting resources uh, if any of these are posing a particular challenge to to any of the uh, anyone in the audience? Like I'm thinking, uh, if you have any recommendations on, um, you know, expert facilitation, for example, that's one of the things that I've been lucky enough to to sit in the room with folks that are expert facilitators, but it's the sort of thing that you might not be able to necessarily pick it up from the book. So if, if there's YouTube channels or there's other examples you might be able to point to. 
Um, you know, there there is a lot of stuff out there. I can't say that I know of any right off the top of my head. Um, you know, to me, this was, I, I had a great teacher. When I was a product manager, we used to, you know, we used to have a lot of customer focus groups with, you know, VP and director level people. And um, we had someone in our company who used to facilitate those meetings. Um, you know, neutral party. She had no vested interest in any of the products. She was just a really strong facilitator. I learned a lot from her um, about just how to keep the conversation going um, and and how to keep everybody focused on, you know, just whatever the conversation was at hand. Um, and, you know, through the years, I guess I've just kind of honed my skills. So I can't, I don't really know of any resources I can point to anyone out there, but I'm I'm sure there are plenty of things out there. There's a there's a video on YouTube for everything. I'm sure there are plenty on there about how to how to be a good facilitator. That's interesting. I'm wondering if that's uh, less common of a developed skill set in the age of A/B testing, um, where we haven't we haven't done a, a, a dis customer discovery so much as through our option A and B up on the the website and see. Um, to see which one people click on uh, in a lot of cases, rather than getting the actual customer discovery, which is under, you know, uncovering the the, the higher level pieces at work. So that would be an interesting, interesting uh, future discussion, perhaps. Yeah, and to me, you know, I think A-B testing is very valuable. It, you know, once you understand what you're trying to help customers accomplish, why it's important and, and why they can't get there, to me, then A-B testing becomes valuable to see which solution they prefer to get to the outcome, right? People put A-B testing things up there. Customers are going to, you'll get some reaction, but it's just, it's relative to one another. So without without understanding the outcome, A-B testing to me is, it's pretty, like, it's pretty worthless. John, a few minutes ago, you asked about, uh, you know, what we see with product or how we handle customer discovery or what we see with it. And what I what I so commonly see and what I think was very profound and what you pointed out, I think focusing on the outcomes is, is a profound um, insight, but also this need to set your own product aside, like not listening through the filter or the lens of your product, but literally truly come in with beginner's mind, you know, with an open mind of, um, you know, they're there may be other solutions because so often, you know, you're listening to somebody talk and you're thinking to yourself, okay, yeah, we do that. We do that. We do that. No, we don't do that. You know, you are, um, you know, you're not, you're not coming in completely objectively. And so I think that's just so critical. I really appreciate you uh, reminding us to. Yeah. To thank you up. for that. And it is, you know, it is one of the hardest things that we have to do as product people because we are so immersed in our product. And and so it's just keep that top of mind at all times and, and you'll be good to, good to go. Um, okay, anything else before I close it out here? Well, it's a very insightful uh, discussion, you know, is that we, we usually, we, we were taught to start with a problem, especially customers pinpoint, how are we gonna solve the pinpoint? Then we, you know, that's a traditional way of teaching, uh, you know, to 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 do product. But I think this, uh, you know, to have the end uh, end, end, end uh, outcome in mind, uh, I think that just, uh, it's a great, uh, great philosophy. I mean, it's a, it's a paradigm shift. I, I think it, it really makes sense. Yeah, uh, I think it, it it just sometimes you know it's probably easy to start with pinpoint, but eventually we have to ask ourselves how this uh, you know solution can help the the strategic objectives, you know, the big big picture. So yeah, the, the product and the, the strategic goal has to align somehow. So yeah, yeah. that's very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? This was great. Uh, really uh, uh, good material. Thank you very much. All right. So a couple of resources for you. Um, I published this book a few years back. Uh, it's an easy read. It's about, I don't know, 50, 60 pages. It's 25 best practices titled Managing Products to Deliver Solutions. 
Uh, it's all about doing discovery and starting with outcomes. Um, again, nice, easy read. Uh, Proficience was the company name before we rebranded a couple of years ago. So that's why you see that on the book. Uh, if you go to our website under the framework section, you will see our product management framework. Um, and you can download that in PDF form, uh, but it follows the philosophy we talked about tonight. Um, if you're interested, next Thursday, uh, it would be noon Eastern time, so 9 Pacific. Um, I've called some of the heavy hitters in from the product management executive ranks. So Allison Maddock, uh, the woman you see on the left there, she's chief product officer for a company that's probably close to a billion dollars, seven product lines reporting up to her. Uh, and then Scott Craig, who you see in the middle, he's senior vice president of products and strategy for a company called SoftDocs. Um, and we're going to have a discussion about the forgotten part of road mapping, um, because I think what has happened, as much as I love Agile, some things that we need to be doing before we get into backlogs and sprints, uh, we, we've kind of forgot about those things. And we'll talk about their importance in shaping the roadmap um, instead of just becoming a feature factory. So that is next Wednesday. And uh, here's the link at the bottom, Product Management University free training seminar. Uh, go to that page and you'll see the link there. And then... <clears throat> Let's see. I don't know how, you know, it must be because it's late at night and I forgot to put a slide in my deck here, but I published a, it's a free ebook um, on top-down customer discovery. So if you go to productmanagementuniversity.com, go to publications and just scroll down, you'll see free ebook, top-down customer discovery. Uh, feel free to go there and download that book. Uh, it's a little bit more um, detail on a lot of the things we talked about tonight. Excellent. Well, I've, uh, in case anybody didn't get, uh, grab that URL, I, uh, I put it in the chat window. So if you pop open the chat window, there's a, there's a link to that training seminar. I uh, wanted to thank you, John. This was a, a really great uh, conversation and uh, love to see the participation from, from the audience and, and a lot of thought-provoking things. I think everybody came away with at least a few to-do items out of this. Uh, and it's, but it's a good kind of to-do item to get you thinking and engaged and, and really uh, wrap your head around the different, different parts of product management and marketing and, and uh, just thinking about that outside of your regular work environment can be mm -hmm. helpful to do on a basis. I see Liz has posted a, a link to your book as well. So if anybody uh, was looking for that, you can click on that in the chat window. Um, and so once again, thank you very much for this evening's uh, presentation and interactive chat. Uh, we we, we uh, uh, will have this posted uh, within a few weeks out to our YouTube channel for anyone who missed it and if they want to go back and review um, and keep an eye on the website. We will be posting next month's um, details uh, fairly soon. I'm guessing at the latest by early next week. And that's going to be an interactive feedback session. So we really want to um, get folks input as product managers. Uh, we, we like to use our skills for improving SVP and A as a whole. So come with your ideas, your thoughts, your questions, your needs. We'll start with the strategic and work our way down through operational and tactical, <laughs> putting, to, putting to work all of this evening's lessons. Uh, and, and really try and put together a 2024 plan for the future of SVPMA. So look forward to hearing from all of you. And uh, once again, huge virtual round of applause for, for John and your, your, your fantastic presentation this evening. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. And thank you all for uh, joining the fray and participating in the discussion. I really enjoyed the evening. Thank you. Hope to see everybody again soon. Thanks, John. Good night. Good night, all.